Biology is the only subject where multiplication is the same as division. Stay tuned to discover this fascinating field one video at a time. In my previous video, I covered the scientific basis of bio-nanogenomics technology, including optical mapping as well as sequencing. Based on the costs and methodology, I did not see any advantage over the current methods or competitors. However, some finance YouTubers are touting the power of cancer diagnostics using the bio-nanogenomics technology, which could represent a significant growth opportunity. In this video, I'd like to see if it's true by first looking at the scientific basis of cancer, how bio-nanogenomics wants to solve the cancer diagnosis problem, and if you stay to the end of this video whether I'm in agreement with the finance YouTubers. I majored in pathology back at university, focusing on the pathogenesis of genetic diseases like cancer. It'll take me days to cover what this disease is all about, but I have to summarize it coherently into this video, which is a significant challenge. But try, I must. I hope that this will shed some light on cancer for you in order to understand how the bio nanogenomics is used to diagnose it. If you appreciate my efforts, could you please turn the like button below, cancerous! Genetic diseases can generally be grouped into three. That is the one gene one disease, where sickle cell anemia is the prototypical example. I've talked about this disease in great detail in previous videos. The second group is also known as the cytogenetic diseases, which involves chromosomal aberrations, and the most famous is Down syndrome. The last group of genetic diseases are polygenic, meaning it involves multiple genes, and cancer is one such example. Cancer is scientifically described as neoplasiums, that is, new growths. And neoplasiums can be divided into two, benign and malignant. Benign neoplasiums are generally harmless, and in many cases, surgical excisions will typically be curative. It is the malignant neoplasiums that is of concern and is generally referred to as cancer. The name cancer also reflects one of the characteristics of this type of neoplasium, which is the unorderly way in invasion of the surrounding tissues of the organs, almost like the shape of a crab, and in Latin is known as cancer. This represents a significant challenge to humans at many levels. First, their presence reduces the biological function of the organ they are in, and patients suffer as a result. Think of cancer being made up of rogue cells that are stealing all the resources provided, but are not contributing anything useful in return. In addition, because of their unruly invasive growth, surgical excision may not be curative, as some cells may be left behind which will regrow again. Worse still, they may then spread from the origin to another organ known as metastasis, and the cycle of invasion repeats all over again. Imagine the suffering of these patients, overwhelmed by numerous non-functional cancer cells in metastasized tumours. And that's not the only thing that these patients have to endure. Traditionally, cancer treatment may involve surgery, chemo, and or radiotherapy. Although surgery is always the preferred choice, there are limitations. Firstly, there's a limit to the number of cells one can remove from an organ. Second, as mentioned earlier, some of the cancer cells may be left behind. And third, there's a limit to the number of times one can go under the knife because each surgery has its associated risks. This therefore limits the ability to cure metastatic cancers by surgery. Chemo and radiotherapy are methods to kill cancer cells by using poisonous substances or radiant energy. In doing so, they do not differentiate and kill everything in its path, thereby adding to the suffering of cancer patients. Not only that, cancer mutations may arise, resulting in new cancer cells. Ah! Cancer patients literally die a little every day, and the suffering that they go through permeates their lives as well as their families. Nobody would wish this for anyone, not even their enemies. So how do cancers arise? This is multifactorial and can be due to age, medical conditions, environment, or inheritance. All of these factors lead to the accumulation of mutations of cancer-related genes. And cancer-related genes itself can be further divided into many categories. Let's look at one of them as an example, genes involved with growth stimulation. There are times when growth is required. For example, we lose skin cells round the clock and the dust that accumulates in your room? Well, skin cells. Since these cells are an important barrier to foreign bodies, new skin cells are made to replace those lost, and cells undergo division to do that. When they do, genes that encode proteins that result in such growth stimulation are activated. Once the process is completed, these genes have to be silenced or the proteins have to be inactivated. Unfortunately, in cancer mutations, they are not. 
which results in uncontrolled cell divisions. And the more cells divide, the more mutations they can accumulate, eventually transforming a normal cell into a cancerous one. And as they start accumulating such mutations, the internal biochemical machinery becomes more and more chaotic. Two things of note here. First, mutations are random and it occurs by chance. Second, the malignant neoplasms can contain a diverse range of cells, where each new cell will acquire a new mutation and that can be different from another cell that is dividing in parallel. And this is going to be a nightmare when it comes to cancer treatment. Some cells in the malignant neoplasm can indeed be susceptible to chemotherapy and be killed, but other cells gain beneficial mutations by chance, allowing them to resist and survive. Eventually, their relentless growth stimulation results in the regrowth of the cancer leading to a phenomenon known as a relapse. Knowing that cancer is due to accumulation of mutations on cancer-related genes, the next question to ask is, what kinds of mutations can arise? Because I mentioned that mutations occur by chance and is completely random, no two cancers are alike between individuals and even within an individual. For example, one of the most commonly mutated cancer-related genes is p53. One cancer patient may have a substitution small mutation resulting in a misfolding and a non-functional protein thereafter. Another person can have a structural deletion of a segment of a chromosome where the p53 gene is located. In both situations, the same gene is affected in two different ways and yet have the same outcome. And I've not finished my story yet. In my previous video, I talked about genomic modifications where there are no mutations at all. If you'd like to have a quick refresher, you can click on the i button above me right now. It is with this understanding that we start talking about cancer diagnosis. Are you ready? In order to diagnose cancer, there's no one golden way. A physician will need to combine the evidence from various tests to come to that conclusion. This may involve physical examination, imaging, biopsies to inspect cells, cancer markers that may be found in the blood, and of course, the proof of actual gene mutation. In my previous bio nanogenomics video, I covered their optical mapping as well as sequencing. Unfortunately, I'm not impressed with both. Now that we have discussed cancer, have I changed my perspective about their company? In this case, the company pushes the optical mapping technology to allow one to observe if there are structural aberrations which may involve a cancer-related gene. As mentioned earlier, this technique may not yield any meaningful result if the mutation does not involve chromosomal structures. It could be a small mutation which requires sequencing or even be epigenetic. On that basis, this method is of limited utility. Not only that, because a ball of cancer cells collected from the patient does not mean that every single cell have the exact mutations. The conclusion of a structural aberration is of limited value because we don't know if it occurred in one of the cells or the entire ball of cells. To hit the nail to the coffin, identifying the cancer-related gene mutation is less important than to know the exact anatomical location, how big the size of the cancer is, and if surgery were to be implemented, whether there are any cancer cells left. On that front, physical examination, imaging, and biopsies play a much more important role. And to finally bury this coffin, if the technique has low clinical utility and as to the cost that the patients have to bear, then I'm sorry to say that the hype generated by the finance YouTubers over cancer diagnosis is largely overrated. However, hold on to your horses because the molecular cancer diagnosis is not entirely useless. Both Duncan and Andre have pointed out in the comment section that Illumina has recently acquired Grail. And the way that this company approach molecular cancer diagnosis is very exciting. In fact, so much so that I may tip my opinions of Illumina despite the ongoing sequencing wars. So will I add a position to Illumina? Stay tuned for next week's video. For the watch till the end gang, I appreciate your support and I hope that you have learned a lot in the process. This bonus section is produced just for you. I'm wondering out loud that if you're interested in investing in biotech stocks, which is why you ended up watching my videos, then are you interested in augmenting your biology as well? Recently, my sister asked me if multivitamins is the solution. Have a whole spectrum of vitamins and minerals and plug any deficiency holes if there are any. I told her to avoid at all costs. This is because there are many components that make up a pill. And one of the ways in which the manufacturers can reduce their costs is by reducing the dosage of the most expensive components or choose a form of the vitamin which is less easily absorbed and hence cheaper. Not only that, some of these vitamins are synthetically made from petrochemicals and solvents. 
So if you are looking into supplementation, less is more. And we're going to look into the science behind the more common ones in the next video. And with that, I thank you for staying with me till the end of this video. You've been awesome, and I'm Benjamin Young. See you in the next video.